I'm back. Hope you guys are staying safe and healthy and let's dive right in. So we are going to finish out The Great Gatsby today. This is our last day working through the text and really we're pretty much done. I just wanted to hold off and do a separate video to cover the last few lines of Gatsby because I think there's a lot of depth there that I want to make sure we cover. So leading up to that, you guys have pretty much gone through the whole novel. Good job. Um, just real quick, chapter nine and chapter eight too, we really finish out the story of Gatsby himself. Of course, we saw the tragic end to Gatsby, his death, his murder by George Wilson, and subsequently George Wilson's Taking His Own Life, uh, a book that truly ends in tragedy. But in chapter nine, we see that Fitzgerald really draws on the perspective of Nick Carraway. And of course, the whole of the Gatsby is given to us through the perspective of Nick. And so in this last chapter especially, we see that it is truly Nick and not Gatsby that is the protagonist of this story. Because Nick has been our narrator this whole time, we really know more about him and the way he sees events than we do Gatsby. So what do we learn at the very end? We've worked through pretty much chapter 9 when he goes away and we saw that this is really a story about the West. This is what Nick says. How is it a story about West? Well, we bring up again this dichotomy, this juxtaposition between East and West, and more than just East egg, West egg, social class distinction. We see that East, New York, the lights, the parties, the drinking, really represents this idea, this illusion, this dream that you can become the god of your own reality. You can create your own reality and defy human nature simply by recreating the past, as it were, with Gatsby. Nick sees this life and in that, again, that tension between scorn and fascination rejects it and wants to move west. And so we end by going back to reality and really trying to capture the essence of what the American dream is in particular, but also dreams in general. So, what does Nick Carraway do on his very last night in New York before he goes back home to the Midwest? Well, he takes one last look at Gatsby's house. So turn with me, please, to page 179, the bottom of the page. One last night, sorry, on the last night, with my trunk packed and my car sold to the grocer, I went over and looked at that huge, incoherent failure of a house once more. Why does he call, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Why does Nick call Gatsby's house an incoherent failure of a house? On a superficial level, Gatsby's house is this giant mansion that played host to a great many memorable parties. Why is it a failure? It was previously described as majestic, if over extravagant, given, but this giant mansion that represents success and wealth and social class. Well, in other words, it represented the dream of Gatsby to deny his past, deny his identity, and simply recreate himself. And because Gatsby failed to achieve his dream because his life ended in death, in a murder, he failed in his dream. And this is what the house represents. So it's not necessarily that the building itself is a failure. It's that Gatsby is a failure. Gatsby's goal his dream has failed. Let's keep reading. On the white steps of an obscene word, scrawled by some boy with a piece of brick, stood out clearly in the moonlight. So he sees that on a brick, an obscene word was written. He doesn't give us an indication of what that is or was. All we know that Gatsby's house has been graffitied, essentially. But on a deeper level, Gatsby himself has been defiled. Right? And so what does Nick do? How does Nick respond to this? Well, it says that I erased it, drawing my shoe raspingly along the stone. Then I wandered down to the beach and sprawled out on the sand. What does Nick do when he sees Gatsby's house graffiti, Gatsby defiled? He erases it. And this, I think, in part, is Nick's whole purpose in writing this story. Again, we, it comes down to this tension of scorn and fascination with Nick Carraway. He knows the truth and the reality of Gatsby. He also wants to believe in Gatsby, but he knows that that's a false dream in itself. So what he does here is he tries to 
purify or absolve Gatsby from any obscenity. Just think of the name of this book, The Great Gatsby. Look at Gatsby's story. Is he great? What is so great about him? He's a liar. He had an impossible dream. He's obsessive and ultimately fails. What's so great about him? It's in part, I think, that Nick is trying to make him great. It's Nick still trying to believe in Gatsby, which we might be, we might be able to say is Nick's own unattainable dream, that he is trying to believe in something he knows is not true, just like Gatsby did. But ultimately, he does go back to the Midwest, so he does go back to truth and reality. But he contemplates while he's on the shore. Right? He goes to the beach, right to the bay, and he's able to see across the water. What does he look now? Keep reading with me. Most of the big shore places were closed now, and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy moving glow of a ferry boat across the sand. Okay, notice a change here. All of the events in the action of Gatsby happened within the three summer months. Now the season is changing, summer is over. Fall is setting in. And of course, fall is always a symbol of decay or death and transition especially. Stores are closed, parties are done, Gatsby's mansion is done, Gatsby himself has failed. So it's a natural transition in the seasons, but also a transition in Nick. So he sits down at the beach and what does he contemplate? Let's keep going. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world, its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. A lot to unpack there. Let's see what's going on. As Nick sits on the beach, he looks upon the houses of West Egg and he sees them one by one. It's this vision of them drifting away, falling away. And in their place, the trees that were cut down. So there is another juxtaposition here. There's the modern West Egg village with the houses and monuments and the social class, etc., etc., contrasted with this image of a pure, untouched land, at least from the European perspective. Nick talks about the Dutch sailors. So the Dutch sailors, are he's referring to the founding of this continent, right? Colonial times. He's putting himself in the shoes of a sailor who was among the first of the European world to lay eyes on the American continent and what that would have felt like, right? So this is really where the connection between the Great Gatsby and the American dream really comes to full effect, right? These Dutch sailors, they came here on a dream. What was their dream? We can iterate that in many, many ways. But the way we want to talk about it for Nick is a fresh green breast of the new world. So this word green, right, the color, we have to grab on that. So the green light, of course, is connected specifically to Daisy Buchanan with Gatsby, reaching for the green light. Why green? Well, because green is the color of the forest that these Dutch sailors would have looked at. So it's almost as if the Dutch sailors are reaching for the green forest of the new world. Right? And so Nick is trying to put that into perspective and he attaches it to this beautiful contemplation. He thinks about the sailors and how they would have looked at the American continent just pregnant with meaning, right? The capacity for anything, for, and it really fulfilled, as he says, man's capacity for wonder, right? This is what draws Nick to Gatsby. In the same way that the New World, the Dutch sailors stood in front of it with awe, so too, does Nick Carraway stand in front of Gatsby with awe and fascination? But at the same time, again, he knows the truth of Gatsby, and therefore, he shuns it, he scorns it. Now, how do we connect that to the Dutch sailors? 
right? The distinction Nick is making here is when the Dutch sailors found the New World, it was pure and innocent. In other words, uncorrupted. But then over time, the idea of the American dream, right, man's ability to pursue his desires, became corrupted by materialism, right, wealth, the division of social classes. All of these things corrupted what was once pure and untouched. And this is what Nick is really connecting. And he's lamenting, and in, by extension, Fitzgerald is commenting on his own society. Right, looking at the world and the American dream as it has become corrupted. Right, and this is where he connects it again. Let's keep reading. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, right, thinking again, this, un, in, this pure, untouched, uncorrupted world. He says, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. Right, this is the explicit connection of the sailors coming to the green new world as Gatsby reaches for the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. All right, so two things I wanna point out here. First, on the literal level with Gatsby, Nick is talking about how Gatsby was in awe of the green light, which of course Daisy Buchanan and everything she represents, as we've talked about. What he fails to realize is the dream has already passed. It's already behind him, right? And this is why Gatsby's dream, of course, is to repeat the past and recreate the past. It's like he's searching for something that's already behind him. Why do I say it that way? Think of what Daisy talked about with Nick. What does she wait for? Every year she waits for the longest day of the year and she anticipates it and is anxious for its coming and is so caught up in searching for it that she fails to recognize when it's there and it passes behind her. This is exactly what happened with Gatsby. He had this dream of becoming wealthy, becoming, changing his identity and he put that into Daisy Buchanan and he had that five years ago before he went to war. Um, but then that passed and he failed to realize what he had when it was present. And so he kept reaching for a dream that was already past, impossible to attain again. Right. And this is what the analogy is. The second part of what I want to talk about with the Dutch sailors again, right? The, the concept of the American dream is somewhat relatively new in the sense that it's always been there for the American continent, but it's new in the sense that we've named it the American dream and that we look back in the past and see how it's developed over time. And so what Fitzgerald is doing here is he's looking at the Dutch sailors, the first colonists. They had a dream and it was when they arrived, right? When they were striving for the dream that was more important than actually achieving it. Because once they got here, it became corrupted. Again, through time, we don't have to go through a history lesson. But just like Gatsby failed to recognize Daisy when he had her, just like Daisy misses the longest day of the year, so too do these Dutch sailors fail to recognize their dream when they achieve it. And the memory that they have that they try to recreate is the wonder and awe that they had when they first looked upon the country. And that's what Gatsby is trying to tell us, or trying to show us is the idea, the wonder for the dream, the pursuit of the dream is actually more important than achieving the dream in itself, at least for this book. Keep reading, keep reading. Gatsby believed in the green light, right? And of course, the green light is, has so much meaning now. It's more than just Daisy. But the green light, like the green trees of the Dutch sailors, it represents everything a man desires. It represents the most unattainable dream imaginable. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms, and one fine morning, break that down. Again, 
Gatsby believed in the green light. I think Fitzgerald, what he's writing this, and he has this idea of the American dream and, of course, just dreams in general in mind. For Fitzgerald and for Nick Carraway, these dreams are necessarily unattainable. They're larger than man can achieve. How, why am I saying that? The way he talks about the future, right? First off, this word is very intentional, and he uses the term orgastic future. Now, <laughs> when reading about the, the publication of The Great Gatsby, Fitzgerald's publishers actually read that and said, Ugh, do you really want to use that word? You should probably use a different word. And Fitzgerald said, no, I want that word. It, for him, it perfectly defined what he was trying to get at. This idea of an intense emotion and longing and satisfaction that never is achieved. Year by year, it recedes before us. It eluded us then. right? So Fitzgerald knows that this dream cannot be achieved. It cannot be attained. This is Gatsby's representation, how he is represented by Gatsby. He's longing for something, striving for something that cannot be reached. But the thing is, it doesn't matter if it's achieved or not, as Nick says. Tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther. And this is what Gatsby does, right? For Daisy, when he's re she feels so close to him when he's reaching for the green light. The dream seems so close when he's longing for it. But again, when he's holding Daisy in his arms, the green light is gone, shadowed in mist, and he feels further away from her than ever before. And this is what Nick is getting at. As long as you're running towards the goal, reaching towards the goal, that's what matters. It's the striving, not the achieving. But the way this is written, right, even the punctuation tells us so much about the ideas here. Nick's, the way Fitzgerald writes it, or Nick writes it, however you want to talk about it. There's an ellipsis, and one fine morning, and a long dash. Now, this is some literary nerding out right here, but this dash is extra long. It's not just a normal break in a text or a pause. It's an extended one. How should we read this? Well, and one fine morning, it's a fragment. Where's the complete thought? Right? There are multiple levels of interpretation here. One, you can't finish the thought. Because if this is describing the striving for an unattainable dream, well, this sentence can't be complete. And the book itself gives us quite an unsatisfactory ending. Right? The guy that Nick built up, Gatsby, dies. Every single dream just falls apart. And one fine morning, what? Nothing. That's the point of it all. You can reach, you can strive, and then there's nothing here. Right? There's a great emptiness and dissatisfaction that this book leaves us, leaves us with. And that's in part because of how it presents the notion of dreams. Right? And what it comes down to here is, it's not that dreams or goals are unattainable, by no means. But, and this is me reading on the book, the problem is they have the wrong dream. They have the wrong goal. By, ne by necessity, their goals are impossible because they're trying to create their own reality, which is simply not something a man can do. Their goal is wealth. It's unsatisfactory. Pleasure always leaves you wanting more. right? And so since these are the goals that Nick has, Gatsby has, the Buchanans, Jordan, all of them, they have the wrong kind of goals that even when they're achieved, they're unsatisfactory. And that's the point of this all. But there's such a deeper meaning to this line here. And one fine morning, flat one. I think what's going on here is Nick is actually having this, it's called a memento mori, a remembrance of death, right? But throughout this whole novel, you have people acting as if there are no consequences to anything. The Buchanans do what they want and hide behind their money. Right? Even the people that go to Gatsby's parties, they live as if they're, they're never going to die. But that changes with Myrtle's death. Right? Once Myrtle is killed, they realize there are consequences to actions. Death is a present reality. And death is the only thing that actually ends our longing. Right? There's a very nihilistic tone to this. But Fitzgerald tries to be optimistic. After he gives us this 
quite depressing, unsatisfactory note, the last famous lines of the book. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Now what the exact meaning of these lines are, I'm, I don't know. Right? If anybody says they know for sure they're lying, there's so many ways to interpret this and you really shouldn't just interpret it one way. More than anything, I'd be interested to see how you guys interpret these lines. But I'll give you my take on them. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Well, let's think of Gatsby, right? Because this, this book, though it tells us more about Nick, is, is about Gatsby as well. His goal was to recreate the past, an impossible dream, right? His goal was to break away from his past, to forget it, and to create his own reality. Which is impossible because our past is a part of us. It doesn't necessarily determine us, right? We're not deterministic beings that cannot escape fate, right? We have the ability to shape and pursue different things. We just can't cr simply create our own reality. We have to develop and grow. But our past does shape us, right? It's a part of us. And for Gatsby, the American dream is necessarily corrupted because his American dream is to disconnect from his past and to repeat it and create it, right? All these impossible things. In other words, it's this unattainable dream. But Nick and Gatsby, they're hoping in this hopeless dream. So why, why am I, where am I getting this from? We beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. The image is of a boat trying to row, row against the current. Right? It's as if the past is behind us and the current is pushing us back into the past. But Nick or Gatsby is rowing in tension with it. He's trying to row away from it, push forward, but he's always drawn back. Right? He cannot simply repeat it. And there you could do it the opposite way, that we're always drifting into the future and like Gatsby is trying to roll back into the past. It, it's difficult to really wrap your mind around it. <laughs> and this might be just a lack in my own reading from it. Maybe you guys can help me out. But it really ends on this note of, uh, for me, on dissatisfaction, where it's a longing for an unattainable dream. And I, to be frank, I'm not satisfied with this ending. I don't know if you guys are. Let me know if you are, because you can have a different read than me, and that's totally fine. But I think what it comes down to here is the dreams of these characters are the wrong kinds of dreams. And why do we read this story? We read it to understand a little bit more about human nature, right? We have these dreams that when human beings, when we put our dreams in the wrong kinds of things, we live in a world of illusions and distractions, and we lose sight of reality. And that can only lead into destruction. And I think that's the key to understanding the importance of this novel. And I think that's something Fitzgerald was longing for, to find the right dream, but he was so caught up in this corrupted dream of wealth and fame and fortune that he missed the point of it all. And I think this is how he felt throughout most of his life. Right? And so we beat on boats against the currents. The problem with Gatsby's dream is he pursued an ideal, right? Even uh, when Nick talks about his past, how he says Gatsby was born from the platonic conception of himself, right? He tried to be something disconnected from reality. And he loses reality. And I think that's the true tragedy of this entire story, is the break from truth and the break from reality by pursuing these selfish and unattainable dreams. And therefore, it's necessarily corrupted. I read this book truly as a tragedy because Gatsby never recognizes the truth until his final moments, perhaps. So we can only hope for Nick that even though he's still at this point fascinated by Gatsby and wants to believe in Gatsby, we hope that by going back to the Midwest, he's reclaiming his truth, reclaiming true reality. And that's what we hope for from Nick as a character, I think. So let's return to some essential elements just to give this story its final holistic overview. So there are a few themes I've been asking you to keep track of 
throughout the entire book, and I just want to quickly run through them, just give you a little my spiel on it, just to connect the whole novel. So the first thing is the narrative voice, right? This is Nick. We learn so much about him because in one sense, he's an outsider from the Midwest who came to West Egg. So he's an outsider uh, who's also an observer. He has this privileged place to see the inner workings of these different social classes, right? And this, pro this promotes a feeling of scorn and fascination in him, which we've talked about so much. And at the end of the novel, he truly wants to believe in Gatsby but he's torn between believing in his greatness and knowing the truth, which leads to the second one here, this double vision or double consciousness. And the way to think about this is illusion versus reality. And so truly the dream in this novel is the belief that one can create a false reality, or rather one refuses to accept the truth like Gatsby refused to accept his past. But what we see is the truth will always come out. And this is represented by, of course, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, right? The all-seeing, knowing billboard, and then Wilson's haunting words, right? You can't escape God, right? God sees everything. The truth will always come out. The other concept I wanted you to follow was the social class distinction, right? This is very complex, and so Fitzgerald's adding commentary everywhere here. And so really this is captured by East and West Egg. Right, old money, new money. That's the first social class distinction. But really to connect this holistically, we have to understand East Coast versus Midwest in Fitzgerald's mind. Where the East, New York City specifically, represents corruption and illusion, creating one's own reality. Where the West is a return to simplicity, a return to truth and a return to reality. And that's where we hope Nick stays. I want to talk a little bit about the colors. Now, we've done a lot of this work in class, and you guys have done some great work really following the color symbolism. So just a few things that I want to point out. Green, right? This is probably the most important color in there. Green, first off, just think of the natural connections. Money, wealth, envy. In, the Gats in Gatsby specifically, we have the green light is Gatsby's reaching out for Daisy, and this is the important distinction, right? It's not about actually achieving the dream. It's not Daisy herself. It's the reaching for Gatsby and for what Daisy represents. Similarly, at the end of the novel, we see that green is the green breast of the new world, the true American dream from the continent's very conception of the Europeans coming over. Ultimately, in this novel, what's presented is Green represents reaching for something that cannot be achieved, whether that applies to the Dutch sailors who corrupt the American dream, or Gatsby who lives in a necessarily corrupted dream. Which brings us to white, right? White is this juxtaposition of green in the sense that it represents purity, innocence. And we see this with Daisy a lot, actually. She wears a lot of white dresses. She refers to her past as this white girlhood where she's still innocent and unjaded and not cynical. And she also refer, or Nick, sorry, Gatsby refers to uh, Daisy's house when he visits her as the White Palace and Daisy as a princess. But along with that, when we look at Daisy's name, right, we have this outer shell, this superficial white, but at the core, at the very center is yellow, which if white is more of appearances, yellow is the reality of something. Daisy seems pure and innocent, but she's really corrupted by her desires, by marrying Tom Buchanan, staying within her social class, always just going back to what's comfortable uh, and practical, right? And this is corrupted here. Yellow is also seen in Dr. T.J. Eckelberg's eyes, and especially that he stands over uh, the Valley of Ashes, right? He and the Valley of Ashes represents really the underbelly of all of this illusion, at its core, it's reduced to nothingness, right? And so with gray, we have hopelessness, people who cannot escape their social class. Um, there's no escape, and ultimately, especially with Myrtle Wilson and George Wilson, who are from the Valley of Ashes, ultimately death. This reminder that life will come to an end, and that all of these illusions and chasing after ideals comes to nothing. Um, so Daisy, is this white and yellow as we talked about and of course the eggs themselves east egg west egg we talked about this and then of course gatsby's car is the mixture of yellow and green so a lot there
And uh, lastly is time. Now, I've told you to watch time, and there are plenty of references to time. But I think at the core of it all <laughs> is the recognition that time is constantly moving forward. Contrary to Gatsby's dream, he cannot repeat the past despite how much he's trying. And so there's this tension between past and future. Right? And this is the last line of the novel. Boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Right? It's just this tension between past and future. Are you always moving towards the future despite trying to recreate the past? Or is it the opposite way where you're trying to recreate your own reality in the future, but you're always anchored into the past? And I think it applies both ways, right? This is why the last line is so ambiguous, right? You're going against the current and it's unclear which way the current is going, but no matter what, you're born back ceaselessly into the past. Whether the current is taking you back to the past or the current is taking you into the future and you're going against the current into the past, right? So many ways to read this. But ultimately, time is running out, right? And then in chapter five, the climax, when Gatsby hits awkwardly, hits the clock on the mantelpiece and it falls and it catches it, right? The clock's mentioned so much until the book, Nick finally says that Gatsby was like a clock that was too wound up and a broken clock, that time for him is gone. And that's a foreshadowing, of course, of Gatsby's untimely death. And so these are some of the big philosophical questions he's Fitzgerald's going with. Now, I really want to bring this back home to Fitzgerald himself. You know, authors write from their own experiences and from their own desires, their own wishes. And in one sense, we can read Gatsby, Nick, even Tom, as part autobiography of Fitzgerald, he put a little bit of himself into every one of these scenes. Now, you could, do a, you could write a PhD dissertation on the historical connections between The Great Gatsby and Fitzgerald's real life. There are plenty there. But I want to point to one thing in particular. So, this is a letter that Fitzgerald wrote following when he discovered his wife Zelda having an affair. Now, Fitzgerald and Zelda, we talked about at the beginning, weren't the best couple. They were actually quite toxic for one another. Um, they were perfectly imperfect, and there were a lot of issues there. But despite the infidelity and despite the wrongdoings, in a, one letter, F. Scott Fitzgerald gets very vulnerable after he discovers Zelda had an affair. And the one quote I want to pull is that he expressed himself and directly connected his feelings to what he put in the novel, The Great Gatsby. And he says, I feel old. That's the whole burden of this novel. The loss of those illusions that give such color to the world so that you don't care whether things are true or false, as long as they partake of the magical glory. This is from Fitzgerald's own words that he saw himself in this novel. And ultimately what he was dealing with when he found out Fitz or Zelda was having her affair is that time has passed him by, right? He pursued wealth and fame so much that he didn't even get to enjoy being a renowned author. As I mentioned at the beginning of the unit, at one point Fitzgerald was the highest paid author in America and was always broke because he was always taking advances on his paychecks, on his royalties, he expected books to give him a lot of money and they didn't, so he was in debt for most of his life, crushing debt. And he realizes, kind of like Daisy, that the longest day of the year, his moment of fame and popularity has passed him by. His glory days with Zelda were spent drinking and partying and passed him by. So he starts off by saying, I feel old. So I bolded a few words here, this I, right? This kind of represents the narrative voice in The Great Gatsby, right? Nick's voice is in part Fitzgerald's own voice reflecting on his life. I feel old, right? This allusion to time, the passing of time, he's aged. He's recognizing that he's past all these things. That's the whole burden of this novel. Right? And think of Gatsby. You can't repeat the past. Why? Of course you can. 
This is Fitzgerald trying to come to terms with recreating his fame and recreating his dreams and desires, but recognizing that they're already past and you cannot repeat the past. He continues, the loss of those illusions, right? This is the double vision, the tension between truth, reality, dreams, illusions, and fantasies. Fitzgerald recognizes that he can't lie to himself anymore. Think of Nick, right? In chapter eight or nine, when he's talking to Jordan, right? I'm 30 now. I'm too old to lie to myself and call it honor. There comes a point where Fitzgerald couldn't lie to himself anymore. He couldn't hang on to these illusions anymore. And he has to come to recognize the truth. But at the same time, he wants to believe in these illusions because he says they give color to the world. Right? And we see the color symbolism throughout the entire novel. The color to the world so that you don't care whether things are true or false. And to me, this is the most haunting part of both the novel and the saddest part of Fitzgerald's life is that when he wrote this after Zelda's affair, he would rather live in a false reality of illusion than what is true. And the abandonment of truth is the abandonment of what makes us necessarily human, right? To, to betray our reason and rationality. For what? Comfort? Pleasure? It's not worth it, though. Even he says it. You can't live your life in these illusions. So long as they partake of the magical glory, right? He was trying to, Fitzgerald himself was trying to live in this high social class of living abroad in Europe, in having the biggest parties, right? This is what Fitzgerald and Zelda actually did. They put on parties and spectacles, but it was all illusion. And even when Fitzgerald can't lie to himself anymore, he comes out and says that he would rather believe in those illusions than face reality and truth. And this book leaves us with an emptiness, a recognition that these are people who had unattainable dreams because they were the wrong dreams, because they abandoned truth, and that will always leave us unsatisfied. And unfortunately, that's where we end our discussion of The Great Gatsby. Of course, we're always welcome to continue these conversations via Google Classroom discussions or any kind of email, whatever you want to do, if anything. So I hope you've appreciated this book. Now, what are we gonna do now that the book is over? Well, you do have a writing assignment due, I believe next class, check the schedule for that. Uh, and it's a really short informal essay, 500 words, that's less than two pages. Again, just uh, if you haven't checked out the prompt, please do so. But you're looking at, you're trying to find a book cover of The Great Gatsby. I showed you a few options at the beginning of the unit. Go ahead, do some research, just Google image search, Cop, uh, book covers of The Great Gatsby. Find one that you think does a good job of capturing the essence of the, the story, the novel. More information on the prompt. If you have any questions, please come talk to me about that. For our next class, just looking ahead, uh, we are going to begin our literary research paper. Now, we're going to do this very slowly. Uh, it's very difficult to do something like this distance learning, so I thank you all for your patience with this and your diligence. Please continue to email me with any questions, but a lot more information next class, starting with our literary research paper. We're going to dive into literary criticism with The Great Gatsby. So until next time, hope you guys enjoyed.